Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I think that my job is to tell you about something that isn't usually talked about uptown, although I think it's a big part of what goes on here at the Medical Center, and that's the Center for Neuroeconomics. About 15 years ago, here at New York University, a group of scholars came to the conclusion that they were studying similar things, though they were in very different places. People in the economics department, the psychology department, here at the medical center, in psychiatry, in neurology, all began to realize that they were approaching the question of how do people make decisions in health and disease from different viewpoints, but asking questions that were surprisingly the same. And that led us about 12 years ago to found one of the really most interdisciplinary centers at NYU, the Center for Neuroeconomics. Now, at the time, the Center for Neuroeconomics was the only center for neuroeconomics and interdisciplinary decision making in the world. I, that's certainly not the case anymore. There are about 70 scattered across the globe in North America, in Europe, shown here, and a growing and very large presence in the Pacific Rim in China. But I'm glad to say that we remain the, I think Dick said this, I'm, I'm sure it's true, we remain the largest and most successful center for neuroeconomics in the world. And I think that the reason we do that is because of these unique features of interdisciplinarity which, represent, which are so well represented here at NYU. So we can combine economic studies in our top three econ department that look at the behavior of consumers and markets. We can combine psychological studies both in the medical school departments and at the School of Arts and Sciences that are looking at both healthy subjects and patients and their decision making. We can use neurobiological tools whether we're here at the medical center or downtown on the square, to ask how it is that the neurons of the brain actually make decisions and how the constraints of our neural architectures lead us sometimes to make good decisions, sometimes to make bad decisions, and sometimes to make pathological decisions. Because of course at the end of the day, as Dick pointed out, particularly uptown, the thing we want to know about is pathology. And I think it's only recently become clear how much behavioral pathology should really be thought of as a pathology of decision making. Whether we're talking about studies of addiction, obesity, the interesting and erroneous decisions many neurological diseases give rise to, all of these form the bread and butter for neuroeconomists working at NYU. Now today I wanted to tell you one story. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of good stories that have come out of the Center for Neuroeconomics. This one's going to be out of my lab and I'm, I'm telling you it because I think it's just fun. It's a study we did about two years ago. What you see here is uh, one of NYU's uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging scanners. This is the brain uh, uh, scanner down, uh, downtown on the square. And what I'm going to do is tell you what happens when we put a bunch of undergraduates in this scanner and ask them to make some interesting decisions for us. Now one of the things we've learned at NYU over the course of the last decade, and it's been validated now at literally dozens and dozens of dozens of laboratories around the world, is that this particular brain area, the medial prefrontal cortex, here you're looking at a side view of a person, his eye would be right here, this is underneath his head, of course, this is the back of his head, that this area in the medial prefrontal cortex has a really interesting activity pattern. If I show you a consumer good, the activity at this location reveals how much you like that consumer good. If I show you a potential partner, that's a polite way of saying it, uh, activity reveals how interested in the potential partner you are. If I show you some piece of food, it tells you as how much you would desire to eat that food. And we've made such headway in understanding the basic structure of decision making that now we can go in and look at these brain areas while subjects, in this case it'll be undergraduates, look at consumer goods going by in the scanner. And we can actually figure out, without asking them, what they like, what they don't like, and predict their choices once they come out of the scanner. So the way that works in a typical experiment like this one, which was conducted by one of my postdoctoral fellows, Ifat Levy, who's now a professor at Yale, is uh, we bring the kids into the lab and they're going to see a group of consumer goods in the lab. These are real goods. They see them all for real. And they understand that some of them they may go home with. Then we shove them inside the scanner. Sorry, that is wrong. Then we, with their consent, insert them gently into the scanner. <laughs> and they lie back and watch consumer goods go by. So they might, for example, see <clears throat> this DVD of the movie Madagascar. And of course, I'm reminding you these are real goods. They've seen these in the lab. And, oops, sorry. And then, this picture of this Monet. Now I have to hasten to add this is not a real Monet in the lab, but instead a poster of a Monet that they've seen in the lab, appropriate for framing in a dorm room. And now all we ask is what's the brain activation we see in this valuation area to each of many consumer goods. Here I'm showing you five that are particularly fun. So here's brain activation on the vertical axis, and these are the five different goods. You can see for this particular undergraduate pictured here anonymously, 
a high degree of activation when he looks at this Moleskine notebook. So we know that this undergraduate seems to like Moleskine notebooks. And alas, these are NYU undergraduates, a high degree of deactivation to this Beethoven CD. <laughs> Unfortunately, you can see a pretty high degree of activation to dodgeball here. <laughs> this is a kind of nice, good, this Akon CD. It also sorts people by age, I fear, because it's a rap CD. And the Monet poster. OK, so the idea now is we know something about these brain activations. So we can take this kid out of the scanner, and we can actually say, which of these would you like, the Molsky Notebook or the Beethoven CD? These are real questions. This stuff's really there. We'll randomly pick one of their choices, and we'll give it to them for, to go home with. And of course, what we ought to be able to do if we really understand the structure of the deciding brain is correctly infer that what this kid wants is the Molsky Notebook. And in fact, if that's the case across subjects in this now two-year-old study, we could achieve about an 87% correct prediction rate. And I have to tell you that right now, pushing the technology in collaboration with a number of groups here at NYU and in Europe, we've managed to get this number up to about 94% right, accurate. So it's pretty amazing at this stage how well we can predict human choice using what we know about the structure of the human brain. And that's the, one of the things I really want to get across tonight as I finish up. You know, 15 years ago, when the Center for Neuroeconomics, when the first Center for Neuroeconomics was founded here at NYU, we really didn't know anything about human, how humans made decisions. I couldn't have drawn you a wiring diagram. I couldn't have told you where to make a measurement. And today, just 15 short years later, 70 research centers around the world, led by us, have built this fantastic wiring diagram where we can point to each of the components of the brain that are responsible for learning how much you like something from repeated sampling, from seeing how to value things and how to store and retrieve values, and to understand the circuits by which we actually make our choices. And of course, at the end of the day, as Dick pointed out, the challenge is to bring that back to policy, to bring that back to medicine, to bring that back to pathology. And we're seeing that happening every day at NYU and at other institutions. So what we've learned about the structure of the human brain has now given us some fantastic new insights into how adolescents come to make such risky decisions and have suggested new ways to train adolescents not to make risky decisions. In collaboration with groups at Bellevue and at Langone and psychiatry, we've made real headway in trying to understand why addicts make the decisions they do. And we're now in a phase one trial trying to understand new ways to think about treating addiction and quantifying treatments for addiction. We made headway in understanding elder decision making, which turns out to be idiosyncratic and interesting, unpredictable in some ways, and it really has pointed out to us new ways that we can help elders to make more efficient decisions. Of course, obesity is the number one prize right now in the United States. And while it's not widely thought of as a decision-making disease, a growing group here in Langone and at Bellevue are beginning to think that along that line and begin to ask whether we can better understand obesity through an understanding of these circuits. And I wouldn't be true to the fact that I'm also an economist if I didn't tell you we also sometimes discover interesting features of markets. Uh, we might discover, for example, how hunger influences market structure. It actually influences it quite a lot in surprising ways. And once in a while, these are things we can trade successfully on. So I want to thank you so much for your attention. And it's been a real opportunity to tell you about neuroeconomics here at NYU.